Hi everyone, it's Nicola here again and uh, welcome back to another home learning uh, lesson. Today we're going to be looking at art. Um, now obviously I know that you don't have the resources necessarily that we would have in school uh, available for you to use at home, but um, as we were starting our work on still life I have uh, I thought there were some, some things that we could still do at home uh, using the objects that you have. So that's the art lesson we're going to be having today. Um, as ever, I hope that you're keeping well, that you're keeping fit. Um, I did Joe Wick's workout this morning. It was really good. Um, I hope that you're doing it too. Um, we'll all be super fit by the time we get back to school. It'll be great. Uh, so on with art. Okay, so for this lesson, all you will need... Um, is some paper, um, a pencil, and the objects, some objects in your house, okay? So you don't need anything else. Um, if you don't have art pencils, which I know lots of you won't have, um, you can just use a regular pencil and it won't make a difference. Um, you'll still be able to create something really special. So we were starting our work on still life before the schools um, had to close. So what kind of art do you think still life is? Hit pause and have a think. Okay, so still life is simply a painting or drawing of objects uh, where the subject matter is inanimate objects rather than living things, such as in portraits, okay? So the the object of the paint of the paint, painting or drawing can't move. Yeah? So it's also not like a landscape because it has to be close to you. So a landscape is something that you would paint or draw from far away um, because you get that perspective and we know that we have our paper oriented in landscape um, if we want to get more into our picture, okay? Sometimes still life paintings are groups of natural objects, food, flowers, fruits, vegetables, for example, um, and sometimes they're objects made by people. So you can see at the bottom here, we've got some still life compositions, that's the word that we use when we talk about the objects that have been put together in a collection, um, that are household objects. So you can see these are these ones in particular are all the things that you could potentially um, have at home that you could create a still life composition from. When you paint or draw a still life, you see things in your own way. So for example, if two people were to draw the same still life, it would their drawings would be very different. Okay, so what we wouldn't have are two exactly the same um, paintings or drawings because different people have different interests and different um, fascinations when it comes to art. So one person might notice the shapes, another person might be more interested in the colour, um, or they might be distorting it, the reality of it, to create sort of a more abstract um, picture. So as we know, obviously art is about mastering skills, but it is also, and primarily people who become artists um, as their career, it is about expressing creatively um, on communicating um, a style, a sense of uniqueness um, about about yourself as an artist. So there is always room for you to have your own expression, your own style with art. Being creative is the most important thing. Um, artists have been creating still life work for hundreds of years. They were really popular in the 17th century. Um, and as a result, we can use them as a source of history. So obviously, when we were looking at World War II, we were looking at different kinds of sources. Um, and obviously a painting that was made at the time, um, for example, of, world, of objects used in World War II, tells us specifically what sort of objects were around. So, for example, it would be really interesting to look at a still life that was done of objects in a rationing, um, you know, a rationing shop or in a evacuee's um, suitcase or something like that or the collection of things that the children took on the kinder transport so we can learn a lot from the pictures uh, that have been painted still life that have been painted in the past um, and these are some examples here of paintings uh, where you can see what sorts of things people had in the past now before you draw or paint um, a picture of a still life you have to set up the composition. Now this is not about just collecting a whole load of random items and shoving them on a table. It is thought through, okay? So first of all you might want to make the space that you're drawing look interesting. So you might put a tablecloth down or maybe some newspaper if that's the vibe you want to go for um, or you might choose to just clear the surface so that you've got just a nice plain surface um, ready for your objects to really stand out. And then the objects that you choose you put together in an interesting composition. So 
This might include sort of propping things up against one another, piling things higher so that you've got sort of different heights, um, a bit of variation in your in your picture. Um, so really it's about thinking what would be the most aesthetically pleasing, and that means what would be the most pleasing thing to look at, okay? So the objects will be grouped together, they won't just be spread out on a table. Sometimes still life paintings can represent the interests or hobbies of a person. So if you look at these paintings, we can, we can learn um, something about the person behind the painting, or we can make some inferences. We might not be correct, but we could make some inferences. So for example, here we've got someone, this looks like a bedside table composition, doesn't it? We've got a book, reading glasses, the lamp for reading from, a nice cup of coffee, hopefully, or tea. Um, when this person, you can see, is obviously really into music, it might be a composer, because we've got, or it might be a, uh, a performer, and you can see the different types of instruments that they've got there um, are, tell us that it's also not set in present day, isn't it? And then here, we've got a collection of things that uh, show that someone might be keen on entertaining. Uh, so you can you can tell a lot or you can infer a lot about the person behind the painting from someone's still life composition. So in science, uh, we were starting to think about Charles Darwin, and I know loads of you have sent Shona and I some really great research that you've done about Charles Darwin and about his work and about why he is particularly significant for us to learn about, um, and even more so um, in the current day when things are constantly evolving and changing. Um, so if we were to create a still life of objects that represent Charles Darwin, what might we include? Hit pause and have a think. So when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, he made a trip to the Galapagos Isles, didn't he, to um, complete his research to find out about adaptation. And so perhaps he would have some his notes or his drawings um, in a book. He might have, he might present those in a still life composition of him. Um, he was really interested in the different beaks of the finches that he found. So perhaps he would have some little models of the finches with their different beaks. That would be that would be representing his work. Um, we might have. So some scientific equipment, maybe some observational equipment that he, he's used. We might have um, his a copy of his book, all those sorts of things um, that would represent the things that he's interested in. Maybe some of the other books that he used as a basis um, for beginning to think about his own research. Uh, so we could put all those things together and then someone will be able to look at that still life and think that's about Charles Darwin. So... I've put together here a collection of items that represent Shona's personality and I'm sure you will all agree these are um, apt for her. We've got sunglasses for her film star persona. She's really into her dogs. Probably you wouldn't have a real dog in a still life but you might have a little model or a toy dog. Um, naturally she would be reading books about heroic dogs um, because she loves them so much. Quizzes, I know that she's super into quizzes and um, hopefully there'll be a quiz coming our way soon. I'm sure she'll be working hard on that at home. Um, and then these very fashionable sorts of um, slippers as someone in my class called them um, that she likes to wear. Um, we probably have some objects like that to show that she is very fashionable and fashion conscious. So obviously we put all these things together. The hope would be that someone will come in and say, that's definitely a still life composition about Shona. Mine would be slightly different, obviously. So if you were to, re to create a still life that represents you, what, why, what might you include? Have a think, hit pause, have a think. Okay, I hope you've had a little think about that. I was thinking about it too. Now, I'm obviously really into music um, and into theatre, so I was thinking I would probably have some tickets from some theatre shows that I've been to, maybe the programme. Um, I might have some music, some sheet music. I might also include, if I had enough space, I've got, um, I play the cello, so I might include my cello in the composition. Um, I might also, I'm really, as you know, I love writing and I love drawing, so I'd probably put some of my art resources in there, maybe a couple of copies of my books. Um, I don't know, you probably don't know this, but I really, really like uh, lighting scented candles in my house, so I would probably put a couple of those in there as well. Uh, maybe some of the things that I'm really interested in, some of my favourite objects, um, I really like bluebells so I, and daffodils so I might put a few of those flowers into my composition as well um, and then someone who knew me would be able to say 
oh, that looks like a composition made up of Nicholas things. So I hope you had a little think about what you would include. Um, because today, what you're going to be doing is experimenting with tone, we'll come on to that skill in a second, to create a still life drawing of a collection of objects that represents you. So first you need to collect some items from your home that represent you and arrange them in an interesting collection. Now these don't have to be special items, they can just be things that um, you have around the house. Um, it could be your favourite book, you might have, I don't know, your favourite uh, pair of shoes, um, a favourite toy, anything that you want to put together in a composition that you think would represent you, okay? So that is what you need to do now. So click pause, have a look around. This might take some time, there's no rush. Um, you've got you've got a lot of time. Um, go around, have a look for some objects, collect them together, and then start thinking about how you're going to arrange them. So obviously when we were at school and we did this with the school objects, uh, we used some books and some folders to kind of prop things a little bit higher to create that sort of sense of depth and um, variety within our composition. So have a think about how you could do that as well. And you will need a clear space. You could do it on the floor, um, but preferably do it on a table if you've got um, access to a space. So you might want to clear away any other papers or books that you've got on the table so that you've got a nice fresh working space. Okay, hit pause and go and look for some items. Okay, I hope you've had uh, a chance to look for those. Um, before you make a start, we're going to talk about the skill that we will be using when we're creating a drawing of our um, still life composition. So I want you to have a think back to your charcoal pictures. What do I mean by varying tone? Hit pause, have a think. Okay, so create tone is about creating that sense of light and dark, creating different textures, creating a sense of perspective in the work that you're doing. Okay, so obviously we're using pencils this time around, not charcoal, um, and that's fine because um, pencils are, uh, I think, a lot easier to create that with, and uh, a little bit less messy as well. But we're going to go back to BBC Bite Size. I know we watched this video before, but um, it's really useful to uh, watch what he says, what the artist says about using pencils to shade. Start your drawing by just sketching in the outlines using something like an HB pencil. A good way to just block in some shade quickly is using cross-hatching. Cross-hatching is basically just lots of little lines that make quite a nice texture in your drawing. You can also combine cross-hatching and freestyle shading on the same sketch. So here I've, I've used cross-hatching on the broader, larger areas, and where I want more detail, I've just worked in some softer freestyle shading, like around the side of the glass. Resist the temptation, if you can, to make your very dark shadows by just pressing down really hard on the pencil. Pick a softer pencil, like a 4B, and just press on the paper with medium pressure. Don't, don't press too hard so that you dig into the paper. Just build up your shade in layers, and that allows it to really blend harmoniously with the other areas of the drawing. Um, it takes a bit more time, but it, it looks a lot better. One good tip for shading is to make sure that your shadows follow the outline of the thing you're drawing. So if you're drawing a sphere, make your marks sort of wrap around the side of the circular object. If you shade against the grain of an object, you flatten the illusion and it looks less 3D. It's a good idea as well to keep your pencil nice and sharp just to get those good fine details into your drawing. Um, I'd recommend sharpening your pencil every few minutes. Okay, so really helpful, I think, uh, to keep referring back to that video. Um, you can watch it through here or it's available on the BBC Bite Size website, okay? Um, there's some loads of really great learning clips on there as well, so if you feel like you want to independently do a little bit more research, then please feel free to go ahead and look on that. Okay, so he kind of touched on this, but we want to be exploring some of the different pencil techniques that you, you, you can use to create texture in your drawings. So we've, we've had a go at this before, I know, in the class. So um, just spend maybe five minutes just having your practice on a sheet of paper at some of these different techniques. Okay, so hit pause, have a practice. Okay. So have a look at the still life that you've set up now. This is going to be the subject of your art. And what I want you to be thinking about is how you're going to vary the tone and texture to make your drawing look realistic. So 
you need to start looking really closely at your art. Now, when I was studying art at school, um, the advice that my art teacher always gave me was that you must look at the, what you're drawing so much more than you would naturally want to look at it. So we have a tendency to look at something and then draw and do it from memory. But actually, we need to be looking and drawing, looking, and drawing, always going backwards and forwards and making sure that we're really looking closely. So looking for where the darkness is, looking for where the, the parts of light are, looking from which direction the light is coming. So this will obviously be different if you're working in natural light, so through a window, or whether you're working with man-made light, so a, a light on the ceiling or a lamp or something. So that will create a different shadow direction depending on where the light is. Look for the shadows because they all are going to be going in the same direction because we un obviously we understand how shadows work. So we, the artist on BBC Bites House was talking about this sense of illusion that you're creating. And that's what we're doing when we're drawing. We, we create an illusion of something being 3D. Um, but it isn't really. So it's all about making sure that those things that are real, uh, we capture by looking really, really closely. So thinking about shadow, thinking about direction, those sorts of things are really important. So I've included on here the step-by-step -step guides that we got from Twinkle last time. Um, because I think they're really useful. So let's have a look. So, step one, to draw in a horizon line from left to right. And obviously we know that this will help us to keep everything in perspective, that we don't have accidentally have something too high or too low or it's, it's distorted reality. Um, and then draw in the basic simple line shapes of the objects, okay? And you can see here that he's used, or he or she, whoever wrote this, has, um, has used some techniques to try and draw a cylinder. Um, so you could experiment with that as well if you've got some of those shapes. Um, also, f always make sure that you've got a blank piece of paper next to the drawing you're doing because you can test something out before you do it in your real drawing. Um, you don't want to be rubbing loads of things out. I think it's better to test things on the side paper and then when you're confident, put it into your drawing. Uh, step two, keep adding the line shapes until you have a complete composition. So you can see here, it doesn't look realistic at the moment because we've just got line shapes, but we have got all the objects that this person wants to create in their still life, which is obviously of like fruit and veg um, and some household objects. Then rub out any guidelines. Uh, it's really important that you don't press too hard when you're drawing your initial outlines because otherwise you won't be able to rub them out. Okay, so be, be light, be gentle. Uh, remember being light and having that flexibility with your, it all comes from your wrist. So be really careful. Uh, what I would always do before you start is take the pencil in your hand, do some wrist rotations, like get your wrist nice and loose. And every so often just shake your hands up because getting tight in your wrist and in your hand will make your, you will be able to see that in your in your drawing. You can, you can tell when someone has been nice and loose with the way they've drawn. Um, then start to mark in any areas of shadow and any highlights uh, so that you know what you're going to do with your shading and your um, variety of tone. Okay, so you can see here um, the artist has marked in places that they're going to make darker so that it looks more realistic. And then you can start to add those light and medium tones to the object, thinking about where the light is coming from. As I said, this is really, really important because um, the light and dark is in the object. Even though it's all one colour, perhaps, um, it, it will have different object, uh, different co different shades of light and dark within it. So, for example, I am looking at a vase um, on my table next to me. Um, it is a cream vase, but on one side of it, it is much darker, and one side is much lighter because I've got the light coming in from the window. Um, so, really look closely at that light and dark. Then, build up the shadows around the objects, thinking about where the cast shadows are. As I said, if the light is coming from the left-hand side, the shadows are going to be cast to the right. They are also going to be cast in the sh sort of shape of the object, not specifically in an outline because you're not shining a light really close to it, but they will be in the vague shape of the object. So look really carefully at those as well. This is where it can be useful to be doing this on a light surface because you can see um, the shadows more clearly if you've got sort of a paler surface. But it doesn't matter if you've got a darker surface, you just have to look really closely. Um, if you have art pencils, and don't worry if you don't, um, then you can use uh, different softness and hardness of pencils to achieve darker areas of tone. So obviously, uh, the softer your pencil, the darker you can um, create uh, tone on your page. Uh, but don't worry if you haven't got those, because you can still just use a normal pencil. Um, just keep everything else really light so that the dark is more obvious. Um, then you need to darken the tones around the objects, and that just 
really makes it pop out as if it's really 3D. And you can see here like this, the way that the shadow is so dark in comparison to the light, it really makes that piece of fruit stand out and look realistic. Okay, so that is the end uh, of the flip chart. Um, have a go. Experiment with uh, with the different light and dark, with the shading, uh, and you can obviously repeat this lesson. You don't have to use the same objects. There's You have loads and loads of items in your house that you could use to make a still life. Um, and the more that you do it, the more practice that you have of direct observation, of looking, constantly looking, and then drawing, looking and drawing, looking and drawing, the better and better you will get at it. Um, it really is a skill that you can get better at. So just keep practicing, um, have, a, have a really good try, and I look forward to seeing um, any things that you send to me or Shona um, on Shobi. So good luck, have a great time doing it, and um, missing you all, hope you're well.